All right. Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, when uh, back when when Jaime had asked me to do this months and months ago, you know, I agreed to do it and uh, uh, thinking maybe I'd talk a little bit about uh, uh, you know the plant materials and and that sort of thing. And, and if anybody knows me, uh, you know, they know that uh, um, I'm very adamant about, um, very passionate about. Um, understanding your plant materials, you know, characteristics of things you're planting, what you're buying, you know, what you can expect from your success, things like that. So, uh, but when I went to go put the presentation together a couple weeks ago, I decided to take a little bit different track with this one. And, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, community ecology um, aspects of, of restoration, how it relates to restoration, and uh, hopefully make it relevant, talk about it on a, on a local scale with local projects, that sort of thing. And, uh, and also this idea of using um, early successional species and cover crops, for example, in, in the restoration process. So a little bit of what I want to talk about today. Um, fortunately, being uh, yeah, started on time, so uh, we were able to, I uh, won't have to be the hero to, to rush it and get everyone out before lunch here. Um, Aaron, Aaron, would you yeah. speak up or get closer to the mic? Okay. Is this? <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll try to speak up a little bit. So, okay. All right, so we'll get started here. Um, I only have 40 slides to go here, which is, is actually technically true. I do have 40 slides, but what, what, why that is is because last presentation I gave, I had a lot of glitches with the transitions. So now I just put a new slide for every transition. So 14 slides quickly turned into 40 slides, but should go really smooth. So we'll see. So uh, a little bit of background. Uh, you know, as with anything, when practicing restoration, your goals ultimately determine your success, right? So lesson, lesson here is if you want to be successful, set low goals, right? Well, maybe not. But I will say, as, as Larry talked a little bit about this morning, is uh, it's very hard to recreate remnants, right? Uh, so if that is your goal and you won't settle for anything less, that's going to be, that's going to be very hard. And as Larry said, it might even be impossible given uh, that we don't have access to a lot of those species that are that are uh, that are in those remnant prairies, so and it does highlight the importance again of, of protecting those uh, remnant prairies. And as, as I said, it's going to be very hard if your goal is to recreate you know nearby remnant or or try to get your site to look like what it did you know on October third you know fourteen o two you know it's just it's very hard to get to that level of success, but. That's not to say you can't be successful. So it's very, uh, very realistic, in my opinion, to improve diversity at sites and to improve system functioning. But with, with success in restoration, it's, very, it's rarely black and white uh, because what tends to happen more is, is this grading of success where you have you know, kind of good, better, best, or you know, what I have up there, um, which is this gradient based on you know, scientific data of, of number of species or um, just a snap judgment of what you're seeing out there, you know, what can be, uh, can be a number of things. And this is an example up here at the top I used in my header there. That's a, a unit uh, next to the Nash Prairie that um, I've kind of mulled over and it's kind of a big headache and I always kind of wondered what to do with it because uh, it's just, it was an old crop field back in the 80s and and uh, this is kind of what's come back. You see bunch, you know, native bunch grasses here and there, annuals, um, a lot of invasive species in there too. So it's just a hodgepodge of kind of everything that's, that's uh, come back on its own since, since the mid 80s. Um, and then you have here, you know, of course your remnant, which is the Nash Prairie itself, which is a, a recent photo. But what I do find in, in restoration is that one goal that seems to tend to cut across all ideologies um, is this goal of getting some sort of late successional plant community established, whether it's, it's, only, it's forbs, whether it's grasses, whether it's a combination of both. Uh, the benefits of having these sets of species in your restoration and on, on the land uh, are just numerous. Uh, from wildlife standpoint, birds, pollinators, insects, um, from an aesthetic standpoint, you know, just, just the look of the prairie is improved uh, in a lot of cases with those species. So um, there's just a lot of, lot of benefits and, uh, to having those types of plant species um, on, your, on your area. 
Um, and if you needed another benefit, um, it might be that the establishment of some of these lake successional plant communities uh, tends to create this positive feedback um, by restoring, by the ability to restore some of the natural processes and in, back into the system. So for example, fire. Uh, what carries your fire? Well, a lot of cases it's your, you know, warm season bunch grasses. So a little blue stem, big blue stem, you know, uh, Gulf cord grass on the salty prairie. Um, you need that fuel, you need that functioning to be able to carry your fire. And of course, fire has many other cascading benefits. Uh, your plant, plant and plant interactions. So the more native cover you can establish, you know, the more, in theory, the more resiliency you can build toward invasive species. Um, and then also you have this uh, concept or this, this ability to um, kind of have a little bit more um, evenness um, in terms of keeping your weeds in check, um, having a weedy look. Um, you want, you have this more kind of evenness of, of grasses and forbs and annuals and all the interactions that, uh, that were once there, you can start to kind of restore um, some of that balance. Uh, plant soil interactions, of course, uh, you know, the plants will feed organic matter back into the soils. Um, some plants will, you know, cycle nutrients. Uh, one, one I didn't put on here, but I should have is your plant wildlife interactions. Larry talked a little bit this morning about some of the insects, how they might inter interact with some of the plants. Um, maybe your goal is to get bison back on the, back on the prairie one day. So there's also that, this benefit of, of having restored plant wildlife interactions as well. So how do we get there? Uh, how do we get to these late successional plant communities? Well, I want to kind of back up way up into the, the ecology textbook and uh, throw a couple of, of community ecology terms out there that you might be familiar with, um, succession being a big one, right? So I've referred to late successional, early successional a couple of times already in this presentation. Uh, those concepts come out of this idea of succession, so the theory of succession. And that was Frederick Clements back in the early 1900s that was considered one of the founding fathers of this, uh, of this community ecology theory. And succession in its purest form is basically this linear progression toward a stable climax, toward one stable climax community, i.e. for a prayer remnant. Um, and that stable climax community is the equilibrium that that site is trying to release, trying to reach. Uh, so before the disturbance, or when it was disturbed, it's trying to get back there, okay? It's trying to re return to a pre-disturbance state, and given enough time, it'll eventually get back there. And one, uh, one small and local example that I've seen of this is uh, Nash Prairie uh, over in Brazoria County, which the TNC owns. Uh, there's actually two pipelines that go through that prairie. And if you didn't see the markers, you wouldn't know that they were there. So obviously at some point, that disturbance burying a pipeline um, was, was able to recover and actually return to a pre-disturbance state. And, and I can, I don't know all the history of, of the property since that pipeline was put in decades ago, but uh, I'm pretty sure it wasn't, wasn't planted and it wasn't managed to, to try to get back to the, that predetermined state. It just naturally revegetated on its own, had a seed bank or whatever the case was. Okay, then the other, the other group of theories out there are called, collectively called non-equilibrium theories. So, um, so Henry Gleason, is kind of one of the one of the key names of this these types of theories. Uh, there's many others, and, and these are more uh, modern theories, I would say. And so, what 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 these collective uh, theories propose is that it's more as sites are recovering. It's not necessarily trying to reach one stable climax community, but it's more random factors are interacting and determining what's going to come back onto that site. So the factors that were there when that plant community first developed aren't necessarily there today. So we shouldn't expect that area to return to a predetermined state necessarily. And, uh, and so there's not necessarily one stable climax for that area, but there could be several. Um, ideas like, uh, you may have heard, like state and transition models, um, a new, relatively new uh, assembly theory, um, Steady state, you know, those are all sort of concepts and terms that are coming out of these non-equilibrium theories. Um, 
One, one example I thought of as I was putting this together at Texas City, we uh, just earlier this year, we finished a uh, drainage and, and hydrology project on the preserve and it required some, some worth work to be done. Some limited areas were, were bare dirt for a while. And uh, as that project was finishing, it was, it was late winter. Right after the project uh, was completed, we started getting rain, it's been wet ever since. Well, what came up on those sites is a, is a native sedge. And it came up pretty dense and it's pretty dominant right now. So thinking in that in non-equilibrium terms, what that was, uh, how, would you, how you would think of this is that because the disturbance occurred in the winter, because there was rain, uh, because of the weather, et cetera, et cetera, uh, this sedge was able to colonize first, okay? And whether that sedge stays as a dominant community or not, which you expect maybe as it dries up, some other things might come in, but whether it stays as a dominant community or not, that sedge being the first one in is going to influence everything else that comes in after it, okay? And so that plant community that results might not necessarily look like it did you know, 300 years ago when it was first formed, okay? So I think most practitioners, including myself, um, tend to adopt more of a hybrid model of these two concepts. So I think everyone recognizes thinking of the usefulness of thinking of succession. Um, things change, you think of early, mid-successional, late successional species, um, kind of those somewhat predictable changes, um, more or less, in a linear fashion, we can kind of see that and, and helps to think about it that way. But the fact of the matter is some communities just for whatever reason just don't ever tend to get there. Um, that process is broken or, or whatever the case is, they, they don't seem to be getting there. You know, maybe you should wait a, a hundred years or a thousand years, you know, you never know. But um, at least in our lifetimes, there's really no expectation that it'll ever, re re ever return to what it looked like before, okay? Some reasons you might think of uh, invasive plant species, you know, that's kind of a, a game changer here in recent decades. So once the invasive plant species get, get a hold, you know, they don't seem to ever want to give that uh, dominance up. Um, even some native weeds, uh, you know, conditions might favor um, some assemblages of, of natives coming in and, and dominating. And again, I don't know if it's gonna stay that way or if it might eventually give away, but they seem to be a lot different than, than what they were uh, years and years ago. But in theory, there is hope. Uh, these, the community development, plant community development can be manipulated toward a desired state. Um, so that's one way you might define restoration. But in order to, to uh, understand that process, it's important to try to find out or try to think about where that process is getting off track. Where, where are things going wrong? Okay, so what factors are, influ are influencing site community development? So one thing I just talked about, uh, the climate and the weather. So uh, is it a wet year, is it a dry year? You know, what happened at the time of disturbance? Um, or what kind of weather pattern are we in? You know, are we in a, in a long-term drought? Are we having fall rain, spring rains, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, El Nino, La Nina, um, all those sort of things. Um, atmospheric CO2 could be playing a role. Um, there's some, some thoughts on that. Um, being atmospheric CO2, as it increases, uh, it, in theory, it could favor CO3 pho photosynthesis plants, which things like brush uh, are a CO3 photosynthesis. Uh, your native warm season bunch grasses are C4 photosynthesis. So atmospheric carbon is not necessarily gonna favor those. It's gonna favor C3, okay? But those aren't necessarily factors that we, we can control, but, uh, but it could be, could be worth thinking about. Okay, now your soils. A um, lot of things going on here. Uh, your soil type would be a big one, right? So you have sand, clay, loam, or what is, what is the combination thereof um, on the site? So uh, one, one, one of the neatest prairies that I've come across are these deep sand prairies. Um, Powderhorn Ranch, for example, is, is one that uh, made news lately. And, and there's others too uh, in South Texas and, and other places where these deep sands, there's no invasive species that are adapted to those sands. You know, invasive species were adapted to more fertile soils. And so 
um, a lot of those prairies will, will successionally come back to a predisturbed state. Uh, you don't have invasive species crowding in and, and messing up with the community. So, but most soils uh, around here, especially in the coast, are more of the clay or loam or some combination thereof, so we do have to deal with invasive species. Uh, your soil horizons, you know, I think other presentations have touched on this a little bit. I think Larry touched on it a little bit this morning. Um, so depending on the level of disturbance that occurs and the soil profile, how deep is your topsoil? Um, your layers might get mixed if you have a shallow topsoil layer or the disturbance was deep enough. And then uh, once that happens, it's very hard to, to get back to that predisturbed state. Your, your soil chemistry gets altered. Everything gets out of whack. Uh, your soil fer fertility, which again, all these are, are related, but your classic NPK, um, nitrogen, potassium, sodium, and then carbon, uh, organic matter are all important. And there's a bunch of micronutrients too that, that could come into play. And then uh, soil microbes is kind of one that has been intriguing to me. Um, I, at least in my opinion, it seems to be more of an emerging area of research and it's not, uh, not well understood, at least by me yet. Uh, I think there's others here that do understand it uh, fairly well. So I hope to learn more about that at this, uh, at this conference. And then seed banks is a very, uh, a very major reason for why um, some of this, this natural succession fails to, to occur. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of the areas that we target for restoration are targeted because the seed banks are broken, right? There's just not the, the disturbance caused, the mixing of, you know, burying the, the, the uh, topsoil and, and your seed bank is, is largely gone. Um, in some cases, there may be a legacy seed bank, and it could be as simple, uh, as, simple as, as removing an invasive species or removing trees you know, that have taken over and, uh, and allowing that legacy seed bank to, to redevelop. But I think in most cases, um, an active uh, seeding, in a lot of cases, is, is required. Um, if you do know disturbance is coming, it has to come. Um, it's, it's worthwhile if you can uh, stockpile the topsoil you know, once the disturbance occurs, you know, they got to get to a pipeline or whatever the case is, and then put the, stop, put the topsoil back where, uh, where it was found. I think that can, uh, there's a lot of evidence that that can help uh, minimize the effects of the disturbance, maybe help accelerate the timeline um, and facilitate that return to a predisturbance state. And then probably for a, a host of reasons, uh, which I covered here, what you end up with in a lot of cases in restoration project is this early, stab, early establishment of a dominant species. So whether that's a non-native invasive, uh, whether it's native weeds, quote unquote, um, whatever the, the reason are, the conditions seem to favor this, this alternate species community. And, uh, and it may not ever reach that predisturbance community or that late successional community that you're trying to establish. So one of, the, one of the things I wanted to talk about today is this, uh, the species role in that process. So it's this idea that, it's not a new idea, I think it's been, been around for a while, and, but, I, but it's an idea that I've been hearing more about from practitioners lately, and so it's something I wanted to, wanted to touch on today. Um, but this idea of planting and establishment and establishing a certain plant species that in theory could help facilitate the expression of your more desirable late successional species, okay? So and the, the theory is it does this by um, creating a resistance to invasive species, for example, reducing direct limiting competition by some of the, the, uh, the native weeds, for example, that might get too tall and compete for light. Um, it can create some responsible ground cover, add nutrients back into the soil. Um, you know, all these, all these processes, processes that could uh, that could be occurring um, with these, with establishment of these early successional species. Um, there's also, I was surprised not to, not to find a little bit more um, literature on it, but uh, I did find one study in, out of Western Europe that actually found that uh, uh, late successional species over there, anyway, um, actually germinated what better in existing vegetation than it did on bare soil. So, there could be some, some evidence that uh, some of the late successional species might actually 
uh, germinate and do better in existing, some sort of existing vegetation. So if you were to choose or, or you know, if you were to choose a early successional species or uh, a cover crop or set of species, you know, what would you, what would you look for? Um, and I think it's something obviously that would be uh, fairly temporary in its expression. You don't want something that would, that would persist a long time. Uh, perhaps a cool season um, plant or an annual and or an annual. Um, perhaps something that's uh, non-canopy forming, that's not going to shade out uh, what you want to establish later on, not going to compete for light. I think fast establishing is, is a key characteristic. You want something that's going to that's get cover on the ground fairly quick. And ideally, you'd want something that's lo uh, native and local. Um, some less ideal species may be out there. Um, for example, weedier species may be acceptable if if some sort of management is introduced, so processes like mowing, for example, which is a fairly common practice in, in northern tall grass prairie restoration projects. Uh, they, they will mow a few times a year to uh, reduce light competition and let the late successional grasses uh, germinate. Um, there may or may not be some, uh, some opportunity for herbicide application. Um, if you can take advantage of a, of a timing difference in, in what you're trying to establish or cover, or some sort of physiological differences, uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, and then there's also a lot of, uh, not a lot, but there's also non-native options. And specifically, one of the benefits is it's commercially available. So uh, cereal rye grain, for example, um, Native American Seed actually has a lot of good information on their website about um, their experience with cereal rye grain, and, uh, which I found very helpful. And, uh, so it's, it's one that, uh, uh, it's a winter cover crop, and uh, based on literature, you know, it does very well at establishing, not persisting, um, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna be invasive. So there may be some situations where um, a, a crop like that could be uh, suitable for uh, establishing some early ground cover to plant later successful species into. Uh, a few things that, you know, Native American seed did uh, did point out is you want to watch for, for weed seed, uh, specifically bastard cabbage in, in those types of crops. Um, Native American seed actually sells cereal rye grain and guaranteed weed free. So uh, if it's something you're considering, you might, uh, you might go there. Uh, but you know, one of the downsides is you, to any uh, crop is it's gonna be an investment. So cereal rye grain, for example, you're looking at about a 50 to $200 an acre investment in seed. Um, to get that established. So, but if it, if it allows you to be successful the first time on some of your later, later successful species, it could be worth it in the long run. And I do want to point out that steel rye grain should not be confused with annual ryegrass. They're two very different species. And I don't think Native American seed or, or I would recommend planting annual ryegrass. And just to show you the difference there, you may have seen seen some of these species uh, around here, but annual ryegrass is a, is a fairly aggressive cool season weed. Um, cereal rye grain is not. Okay. So I just want to finish off with, uh, with talking a little bit about species availability and, and how might we get there. Well, one, one way that these species are available is in the current seed banks. So if you do, a lot of cases, any restoration project with an old ag field or um, fairly heavily disturbed areas, you're gonna have some annual re weeds still persist. So again, if some sort of management can be introduced, it might be uh, able to transition um, out of those communities and into a, into a later successional uh, community. Um, harvesting some of these, uh, some of the native uh, species that we might identify, uh, things like uh, one I've always been interested in is little barley, for example. I'm sure we can go around and probably think of many, many others. But the desired characteristics um, for this cover crop idea also make them very difficult to, to target mechanically and harvest. Uh, so you're kind of limited to hand harvest at that point, which is also very you know time consuming and, and labor intensive. But I am a I am a strong advocate that. If there's a will, there's a way. And uh, I think if there's enough attention and enough 
uh, desire for it, you know, innovation will take over. And I think uh, people could develop some specialized equipment to, to target individual species like the crop species. Uh, from an industry standpoint, it's, it's very tough to work with growers because it is a fairly limited market um, for, for these species. You know, we're, we're, you folks here, for example, are, are uh, part of the market. And so, but it's just not a very broad market in terms of a seed grower and what they need to invest in and, and that sort of thing. So again, that might point back to uh, using some of the cover crops that are available, the CROI grain. Um, another, another possibility is, is grow out efforts, uh, local seed plots. You know, if your organization has that capability or volunteers to, um, to, to, to invest the time it takes to, to grow some of these species and keep them maintained and keep the weeds out and that sort of thing. And, uh, and really, what, where we're, the stage I think we're at now in a lot of these projects, and from what I talk to with partners, is we're kind of in that stage where we need to show success. Okay. So a lot of these these projects that are upcoming, uh, coming online, uh, I think as we build success, uh, show success, we can build on that um, and help to grow the market and help to get those species available. So. so with that, I will conclude and take any questions you might have. No, no, that's, uh, we do have deep-rooted sedge at Texas City, but uh, that's not what came up. It's actually a native sedge that came up. Uh, I think we have about 20, 20 to 23 species of sedge at Texas City, and, and all but one are native, so um, this was actually a native sedge that came up. Um, well, the short answer is, I, I think Bill Neiman at Native American Seed has shown some success with uh, restoration projects in, in other parts of the state. Um, as far as locally here, um, it's, I haven't seen any success, successful projects yet. Uh, it's it's a, a concept that I'm hoping to uh, research a little bit at Texas City. If you're on the tour tomorrow, you'll kind of see um, our plans for uh, implementing some of these projects and hopefully showing some success. and what it might take to transition some of these areas, you know, kind of along that path to those desired communities. So hopefully I can demonstrate uh, some, of those, uh, some of those techniques uh, successfully, so, but that's kind of in the works. Uh, that's, that's the hard question to answer. Uh, I think there's a lot of unknowns out there right now. Um, it's not, uh, I, I know some of the theories, but you know, as far as what actually happens, it's gonna be, gonna be hard to predict, I think, so. Yeah. But as far as uh, individual restoration projects, uh, you know, what's happening on the ground tomorrow, um, you know, I don't know that anything's gonna change there. Uh, I, th I think a lot of, a lot of times it's more opportunity, opportunity driven uh, versus, um, you know, kind of these broader, broader ideas of, of climate change and how that might, might affect it. But. Well, again, it's going to depend on, on the site itself and, 
And, uh, you know, if there's a healthy seed bank there, sometimes remove, just removing the invasives will allow, uh, allow the plant communities to, to, uh, to come back. But uh, if, if the seed bank's not there, then removing the invasive is just going to, you know, pop up, uh, you know, with whatever, whatever's in the seed bank. And so I think the first step would be to just evaluate what's, what comes up after removing the invasives. And then um, as far as, you know, the, the plan for, I think it's going to depend too on how aggressive you have to be on those invasives. If you have to, to wipe everything out and start over, then that may be a situation where it, it could be beneficial to apply a, a early, you know, early successional uh, plant community into that. Did I answer, sorry, did I answer your question? Or? Well, I think uh, uh, planning, planning them all at the same time might be a better approach initially. Um, if, you can, if you have the species available to plant, um, you know, planting them all at once would be... Yeah. Yeah, those are difficult, difficult environments to, to plant into, to restore into. Well, sir, just to kind of tack on to what she asked, if nobody was around to see these prairies evolve, how do you know what the early successional species are? That's kind of just a guess right there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think so. It's going to be, I think we, we tend to, you know, see what, uh, what's, you know, considered native and then what comes up early. You know, I think those are the ones we tend to point to as far as the early, early successional. Uh, what germinates quicker, uh, what establishes quicker, that sort of thing. So. Yeah, but that's still all kind of a guess, isn't it? Because nobody, we, nobody in this room ever saw a prairie evolve, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so that's all kind of a guess. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I mean, it's, the fact that it's growing there now um, would, would lend support to the idea that it was native and there at one time, um, yeah, assuming it wasn't. About being native or not, I'm yeah. talking about what came first. Typically, we see it now. What we're seeing is you know, when we first got here, you know, as Europeans, we were seeing probably this be a climax community, correct? Right. So I'm saying, has anybody ever seen what came before that? I'm thinking no. But I like your answer about throwing the whole kitchen sink at it. That's mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, in, a, in a fire situation? Have, have there been studies on, on the changes of soils throughout the prairie's history? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I guess I'm not understanding the, could you repeat the question again? Okay, you have a fire, mm -hmm. you have your soils, you take, take a test, and then a year or two later, various plants come up, probably your earlier successional plants, you do another soil study, and then, you know, Five, ten, however many years, when you start getting your climax communities, you do more soils analysis, microbes, whatever. I, I, I'm not a soil scientist, so I don't know all the while what what you can do. But I mean, has any of that been done? Because maybe that can affect when you're you putting. You know, we're always putting in these climax plants, but maybe the soil's not ready for it yet. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm sure there has been some work done. Um, see. Was there some, anybody here that had some, some there's thoughts there's, on that, John? I mean, I, yeah. I am a soil scientist, but I, you know, I remember in my early days, colleagues who, you know, there's all kinds of literature on, on fire and soil, and, it's, and it may be sort of in the minutia of soil, it's not like clay sand silt, it may be microbes and crust and water, but there's, there's plenty of stuff out there, absolutely, mm -hmm. but might need a PhD. <laughs> 
right, yeah. It's easy to get overwhelmed with, with some of the literature, I think. There's more yeah. that we don't know about soil than we know. Okay. Yeah. Right. One of, the, one of the mechanisms of succession that, that we know and is useful for respiration is, is that the annuals sequester nitrogen. And the perennials have a competitive advantage in the absence of nitrogen, so they displace the annuals. That's, that, that's something that you can incorporate in the experimental community or respiration design. We actually Any other questions uh, for Aaron before we uh, break for lunch? I don't want to keep anybody away from the lunch box. No. So. Thank you, Aaron. All right, Aaron, thank you. Thank you.